Tywin's always been the power behind the throne to some extent, and it's ever since the death of Robert Baratheon, he's been the real, the sole power behind the throne. But this is the first time he's ever wielded that power in the capital itself. And so, like, uh, like the CEO that he is coming to run the company that he runs, he wants to show people exactly who's boss, and he wants to put people off their guard, and he wants to give them uh, kind of a contest between all the, the players of his council to see who sits where, and, and I think the way in which they react to it tells him and tells us a lot about who they are. You know, all the small council members recognize that Tywin is the true power, and they all want to be seated as close as possible to the true power, so Littlefinger, because he's the most ambitious, and to shove his way to the front and grab the seat closest to Tywin, and Varys is kind of, you know, rolling his eyes about that, but he's not surprised, because that's Littlefinger, and, you know, from Varys' perspective, uh, it's okay, like Littlefinger can sit closest to Tywin. And Pycelle, you know, just wants to keep on keeping on. You know, he's, he's, he's the Grand Maester, he wants to survive. And then Cersei comes in, and Cersei is, is just not gonna abide by these rules, you know? So she sees the chair set up, and I'm just gonna drag one right next to my dad, you know? <laughs> and, you know, screw the rest of you. And then Tyrion comes in, and the kind of, the question is, well, how can Tyrion, you know, match any of that? And you know, what we love about Tyrion is he's, he's one of the few um, players who's, who's willing to stand up to his dad from time to time. And so he's not going to try to sit closest to his father. He's going to sit as far as possible away from his father. And he's going to make such a point of it. And he's going to drag his chair to the opposite end of the table and, and, uh, and make a joke of it. So I think you see kind of all, all their personalities emerging in that one dialogue-free moment. I have dragons. I'll give you one. You will win the throne with dragons, not slaves, Your Grace. Alice, please. Danny has her lovable side, but she's also ruthless and she's also fiercely ambitious. And it's not even like a little finger style ambition where she's trying to climb, you know, this the social ladder. It's almost like a Joan of Arc kind of ambition where she feels like she has this almost divine mission and nothing's going to prevent her from achieving it and that might mean sacrificing those who are closest to her. Giving away one of the dragons seems like a completely insane thing to do, especially the biggest one. I mean, we know that historically the biggest dragons were this bigger than school buses and they were weapons of mass destruction and able to lay cities to waste in minutes. And no matter how big and effective your army of 8,000 uh, soldiers is, they're taking even a small city is going to be a, kind of a dangerous prospect for them. And the idea that she's going to give away what they see as her f real future for a chance at a small army now seems insane to them. Your father, he'd pay your weight in gold to get you back. You'll be a rich man till the end of your days. Your sons will be rich men and their sons after them. Lands, titles, you'll have them all. I'm telling you to Jamie from the tree. Come on, man. One of the reasons he's so arrogant is that he was a prodigy, not just that he's the uh, scion of the, the wealthiest family in Westeros, and uh, um, which would probably lead to some degree of arrogance, but also he was better at sword fighting than almost anyone alive and became the youngest member of the Kingsguard and, and uh, was a legendary fighter and champion, and um, so even if people hated him, they had to respect him because he was really good at what he did, and then he loses that. Jamie losing his hand is a classic George maneuver, and it was a very intelligent and very interesting move uh, on George's part because uh, it's killing a person while leaving him alive and, and walking. It's taking away the root of someone's identity and ripping the ground out from under them and stealing everything that defines them with one chop of a, of a carving knife. Locke, you know, just sees this arrogant man who's just, everything has always come easily for him and he's always expected um, that, you know, if he gets into trouble, his father will bail him out and, and uh, he doesn't want to just kill him. He wants him to be aware that life doesn't always work out that way for most people and now for you, Jamie Lannister. So just as, as Ned's beheading was a complete shock, I think, um, Jamie's behanding is, is, uh, comes out of the blue, and you just don't see it coming until it happens. Ah, 